Well, good morning again. Um, I am excited about our Missions Emphasis Month, and I didn't uh, mention this um, earlier, but you guys were introduced to the Christmans uh, on the screen, the video with all the kids. And why do missionary families have so many kids? Ask Andy and Stephanie Gable about that. Um, but uh, Andy and Stephanie and Sarah and I went to college with the Christmans, Caleb and Don. And so it's just a great joy in my life to see us get to partner with them and their new uh, ministry in Delft and the Netherlands. And, and I'm just excited for you guys to get to know our missions partners more. So if, if, if you want to go out at these doors, there's a display out there and, and you can find out more information about our missions partners and opportunities for you to just pray for them and to, to maybe get involved more um, with our, our missions partners. Uh, we're continuing in uh, our study in Hebrews. This is week eight. Uh, of what I thought was going to be a six-week series. So we're doing great so far. It's, uh, I, th- I think there's just one more. Next week will be one more, and then uh, we'll start a new series called From Acts 1-8 to Church and State. And I'll just let you guess what that might be about, and you can worry about it and stress about it. I am. Uh, but we're going to continue in Hebrews, and so I, I think it's important to remember uh, why this was written, who it was written to, and what the purpose of this letter is. And so if you've been with us for the last few weeks, you can, you can say all this along with me if you're new. Uh, here's, here's why uh, Hebrews was written. Uh, we believe that this is a message, a sermon, that was written to a group of Jewish Christians, so people who grew up Jewish and then became Christians, followers of Jesus, who are living in Italy, and they're paying a very high cost for following Jesus. They're finding that when when they get really serious about uh, moving in the direction of Jesus-centered living, it puts them in conflict with their culture. That conflict creates friction and it's painful. And they need a word of encouragement. And so the word of encouragement, the message, the the theme that kind of runs through this letter or sermon is hold on to Jesus. Just hold on to Jesus. I know there are a lot of reasons in your life. There are a lot of things that can make you want to let go of Jesus and revert back to something easier and simpler but you got to hold on to Jesus. Jesus is where it's at. Jesus is the only one who can really give you what you need. So hold on to Jesus. That's the message. Get a grip on Jesus and don't let go. So as we pick up in chapter 10 here, we're going to see a look back at what some of these believers have been through and this encouragement to continue in faith. Are you ready? Great. I'll I'll just do it. You're stuck here. I mean, what else are you going to do? You got to sit here while I talk, so... Um, remember, if you see scripture underlined on the screen, that's your part. Please read that aloud in unison in English, preferably. Hebrews 10, 32. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And, but my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. So the preacher here is pointing these people back to the times when they have suffered because of their faith. And he's saying, do you remember the times when it cost you a lot to be a follower of Jesus? And he points to some things. You were insulted. They they took away your property. Some of you were in prison. Do you remember those times? And he says, That's when you were at your best. Those times when it was the hardest for you to hold on to Jesus, but you held on anyway, man, that's when you were really at your best. He says, you joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. Picture this. People come into your home and begin to haul your stuff away. Your car is being towed. Like your house, they're kicking you out of your house and telling you you can't live here anymore. Are you joyfully? Except you're like, all right, cool, no problem. Is that, this is how they responded. You joyfully, because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions as well. You you knew, hey, all of this physical world stuff, my car and my house and whatever, it's all temporary anyway. 
I have possessions that are eternal. I have, God has given me stuff that no one can take away, so I'm okay. That, that was their attitude. And he's pointing them back to this time and saying, hey, remember this? This is when you are really at your best. And I think the, the warning here is, don't go back to an inadequate and incomplete version of your faith because it's going to be easier. Easier in the life of a follower of Jesus is not better. More comfortable is not better. More convenient is not better. You were at your best when it was tough. Now, why, why is that? I, I think we can look at times in our own lives. You can look back on moments when it's been really difficult. You've gone through some really hard things. Maybe you're there now. Maybe you're going through something really difficult right now. And you go, man, this, this is when my faith is the strongest. And it's when we're comfortable and, and things are, are easy that we find that God feels distant and we're not practicing our faith and expressing it in ways to honor him and grow us up. Why is that? I think it's because when we're comfortable, we don't recognize our need for Jesus. When things are comfortable, when things are easy, you don't, you don't wake up every morning going, man, I hope Jesus is with me today because if he's not, I'm just not gonna make it. You, you can wake up in your life, if, it, if things are going well for you, you can wake up tomorrow and you can not acknowledge Jesus all day and you'll probably be okay. Like you, you'll still eat meals and you'll live indoors and no one's gonna insult you or come and take your house away. Probably. So where's that desperation for Jesus? It's like when you go to the beach. How many of you would like to be at the beach right now? You're, this is what you're thinking about, dreaming about. I wish that's where I was. So imagine, just imagine. Uh, we'll take this indulgence today. So, you're at the beach and you've, you've got your life jacket on and you're standing ankle deep in the water, in the sand. You know that feeling of the sand under your toes and the water's kind of washing it, the waves are kind of washing it uh, under, out from underneath your toes. It's a cool feeling. You like that? The question is, why are you wearing a life jacket in this picture? You're ankle deep. Do you need a life jacket when you're ankle deep? I hope not. I don't know what good it's gonna do you. You don't even need it. So just take it off. Just forget the life jacket, throw it. If, if all you're gonna do is stand there ankle deep, you don't need the life jacket, right? But what we're called to do is step out, right? We're called to, to move out into deeper water. And so keep the light, let's put that back on. If you're imagining with me, put it back on. You're gonna need that in a minute. We're, we're stepping out into some deeper water. And as you feel those waves start to hit your knees, you're like, oh, this is a little more exciting than just standing there in, in ankle deep water. Like, I, I like this. And you, and you step out a little farther and it, and it starts to hit your waist and it rocks you back a little bit. You know, that feeling of getting rocked back by the waves a little bit. And you have to start over again. And you keep going and it's hitting you in the chest now. And you're like, okay, that's, that was close. About went under. Don't want to get my hair wet. Like, not a problem I have. Some of you, maybe, I don't know. But where the good stuff is, where the really good stuff of our faith is, is when we get in over our heads and every wave that comes threatens to take us under. And that's when we're holding on to Jesus, the tightest. That's when we know, man, Jesus, if you don't hold on to me, I'm, I'm toast, I'm done. I'm not gonna make it. That's what he invites us into. That's where the beauty and intimacy of our faith really shows up. So the writer is pointing these people back to the times when they were in over their heads. And he says, that was when you were at your best. So why would you go back to something else? Just because it's comfortable and convenient and painless and easy. And you're gonna, you're gonna neglect your need for Jesus when you get to that place. So this is, this is what he's pointing them to. He's gonna talk about faith and reward. He says, don't throw away your confidence, your faith in, in, in Jesus, because it will be richly rewarded. So let's take a look at what faith really looks like. What does the Hebrews writer mean when he talks about faith? So Hebrews 11, this is the next chapter. We're gonna look at verses one and six. And, and this is not like intended to be a definition of faith, like the end all be all definition of faith. It's just a description of faith. And so let's, uh, let's keep that distinction in mind. Uh, Hebrews 11, one and six. 
Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So saying we're, we're putting our hope and our confidence in something that we cannot see. And the inverse of that is true. We are not putting our confidence and hope in things that we can see and taste and touch, things that the world can take away from us. But we're putting our confidence and hope in something that we can't see and that no one can take away. And verse six, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that there's a reward for those who continue in faith. So what, what kind of faith is he talking about? I think when he gets into chapter 11 and goes through what we're gonna see, this roll call of the faithful. Some of you have heard of that, the hall of fame of faith. He's gonna go through all these people. I think what he's describing is uh, this kind of faith, faith that is the process by and the extent to which we allow God to direct our lives, okay? The process by and extent to which we allow God to direct our lives. I, I think we make a mistake if we boil faith down to a belief statement, And if we say, well, I have faith because I believe that God is real, I believe that Jesus is God and that he came as God's son, he died for my sins and he rose from the dead. I believe all of that. I agree intellectually with those statements. And we say, well, that's my faith. That that belief is a starting point of faith. We have to believe that God is real. This is what he says here in verse six. And we have to believe that Jesus is God and came as the son of God to die for our sins and rose from the dead. But if that mental, intellectual agreement is where our faith stops, then what we're missing is this this whole journey of allowing God to direct our lives. I think that's the part that's scary, right? It, It is scary because where is he going to send me? Like, what is he gonna do? If God is in control and God directs me, where is he going to direct me to? Terrible grammar, but you get it, right? Where is he gonna send me? What is he gonna do in me? What is he gonna make me do? Or what is he gonna challenge me or invite me into? Well, I don't know. That's the scary part. But that's what the Hebrews writer means by faith. So he goes through this this roll call of the faithful and he, he talks about Abel and he talks about Enoch and he talks about Abraham. And he says, these these people allowed God to direct their lives. God told Abraham, pack up your family and move. And Abraham's like, all right, where are we moving to? And he said, west. He's like, is that, do we have an address that I can plug into the maps? Because west is a big place. God said, just go west. I'll tell you later. I'll tell you when you get there. Well, that's not we, we don't like those kind of directions. Abraham allowed God to direct his life and move him in a direction that was risky and uncertain and scary. And later, when the son of promise finally comes, Abraham's been waiting for 25 years for this son to come and he finally has Isaac and God tells him, I want you to take Isaac and I want you to sacrifice him on a mountain. This is allowing God to direct his life in a way that is going to be extremely painful. Can you imagine that walk up the mountain with his son and his son asking the question, dad, where's the, where's the sacrifice? And he's thinking, I'm afraid it's you, bud. And he's willing to go through with that because he's allowing God to direct his life. In case you don't know the end of that story, let me set your hearts at ease. God does not allow him to sacrifice his son. But what he's looking for is, will you let me direct your life? And he talks about Moses and he talks about Joseph and he talks about Deborah and all of these people who allowed God to direct their lives. And what does he have to say about them? Let's uh, see towards the end of that chapter, verse 39. He says, these were all commended for their faith, yet since God had planned something better for us, that only together with us, would they be made perfect? So they're commended for their faith. They're commended for allowing God to direct their lives into painful, uncomfortable, difficult circumstances, sometimes circumstances that cost them their very lives. And he says they never actually got the full promise. They they didn't get to experience the completed promise of God, which, which for us and for them is the same. It's the new creation. It's this, what we mentioned earlier, sitting down at the feast in God's kingdom with every tribe and tongue and nation. That's what's coming. 
So he says that they didn't receive it yet because God had something better planned for us. That God wanted us to get to experience sitting down with these people who centuries ago allowed him to direct their lives. And he, he wants us to be thinking about the people who have gone before us. So take a minute and think about that. Think about people who, they're no longer here, but their legacy of faith has impacted you. Their choice to allow God to direct their lives may be why you're here today, part of it. He said, we're, we're gonna get together again someday and we're gonna have a party and it's gonna be like none other because we have allowed God to direct us. We've moved forward in faith and we're gonna receive that reward. He continues in chapter 12. Oh, well, let's not get to that yet. Sorry, I skipped. Oh, we were gonna get out early if I skipped that far. Uh, let's talk about the reward. What's the reward that um, is waiting for us? So let's talk a little bit about why we should contemplate sacrificing comfort and convenience now, stepping into discomfort and inconvenience. What are we giving that up for? What does God promise? Well, what God has promised is eternal life in the kingdom of God. That's, that's the promise in a nutshell, eternal life in the kingdom of God. And so here, here again is something that I, I think that I was raised to think of eternal life as the thing that happens when you die and go to heaven, right? You die and then you get to go into eternal life where there's streets of gold and maybe there's angels on clouds with harps. Anybody ever have that image in your head? And you're like, I don't, I don't know what's happening here, but it's, it's probably good. It's, I mean, I'm sure it's great, right? This is not how Jesus talks about eternal life. When Jesus tells people about the kingdom of God, he tells them, hey, the kingdom of God is among you. Like it's within you. It's, it's here and present now. It's an alternate reality that you get to choose to live in right now. And here's what life, this eternal kind of life in God's kingdom looks like. Jesus calls it an abundant life. In John 10, 10, he says, the thief has come to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life. Life to the full, abundant life. That's what Jesus says. Life in the kingdom, this eternal kind of life is an abundant life abundant life. That's a life of peace and joy. Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter four, where he tells us if we, if we pray and, and we learn to turn our anxieties over to God, we can experience a peace that makes zero sense from a human perspective, a peace that passes understanding. That's the peace of laying your head on the pillow at night and knowing without a shadow of a doubt that you are in right relationship with God, with yourself, with the people around you, as much as it depends on you and with creation. That's peace. Jesus says, you, you can start to taste that. You can start to experience that now. And, and, and you have, many of you have, you've had those times when your confidence in God was so high that you went to bed at peace at night. That's not every day though, is it? I mean, until the new creation comes, we're not gonna have that every single day. But the idea is as we move in the direction of Jesus-centered living and we allow God to direct our lives through faith, that we experience that kind of peace more consistently. And it lasts longer as we go through. Jesus talks about joy. In John 15, he says, I, I want you to have my joy. I want my joy to be in you and I want your joy to be complete. I want it to be filled up. I want your cup of joy to be overflowing. That's what he wants for us. And that joy, that's, the, that's that waking up in the morning and knowing God is in charge of this day and that is a very good thing. God's in charge of today and I'm glad. I'm glad I'm not in charge of today. And that's joy. That's freedom right there of being able to say, I'm not in control. We're in a reno renovation project at our house right now. And I wake up every morning going, I'm not in control. <laughs> I am so not in control. Like I, I, am, I have the least control over, uh, of anyone over what's happening in my house right now. I don't like that feeling. But man, when we become convinced that God is in control and that is the best possible scenario for me, that's joy and freedom. You don't wake up like that every single day. I hope you have days like that when your confidence in God is so high, you wake up and you know, man, God, you're, you're in charge today and, and I couldn't ask for anything more. But it's not every day. But the idea is as we move in the direction of Jesus in our living and we allow God to direct our lives through faith, we get to experience that kind of joy more often and more consistently and it lasts longer because we're, we're letting him direct us and then beyond what we get to experience here and now, this, this increasing levels of peace and joy and purpose, we have something else to look forward to. In Colossians chapter three, 
Paul tells these believers that when Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. He's telling them to, to keep their eyes on Jesus. And, and here's what's coming for you. If, if you stay faithful, here's what's coming for you. Jesus is going to come back in glory. Glory is about when everybody recognizes who he really is and praises him for it, right? And he says, you're gonna get to share in that. That, that God is gonna actually call out in you who you really are. And, and you get to recognize along with all of your brothers and sisters in Christ that we are exactly who God made us to be. Uh, that's not true of me right now. I can't look in the mirror and go, man, I, this, you are exactly who God made you to be. There's too much junk still in my heart, too much of my sinful nature still holding on. But there's coming a day when Christ, who is my life, appears, I will also appear with him in glory and I'll be able to look in the mirror and go, hey, today I am finally exactly who God made me to be. That's glory there. And it's coming. It is coming for those who are in Christ. This is the promise. And then I think this picture that painted for us in Revelation is just beautiful and, and puts some good imagery to what Jesus is describing when he talks about eternal life in the kingdom. Revelation 21, one through four. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. This is what we're looking forward to. This is the reward that we get to share in with the people who have gone before that we're gonna sit down at the same table with Abraham and Moses and Ruth and Rahab and Mary and David. And we're gonna sit down with these people who have gone before and we're gonna celebrate the fact that we are now free. There's no more fear you don't have anything to prove to anyone anymore. You have to earn anybody's respect. You don't have to worry about your own guilt and separation from God. There's, there's no more crying. There's no more cancer. There's, there's no more sickness. There's no more COVID. There's no more traffic. There's no, like, it's all gonna be good. This is what we're looking forward to. This is the reward that he's promised for those who live by faith. And when we say live by faith, remember, we're not saying I live by this mental, intellectual agreement with the statement that God is real and Jesus died for my sins. We start there. But when we say live by faith, what we mean is I am learning every day to allow God to direct my life, even when he directs me into something difficult and uncomfortable and painful. I'm growing in faith. So here's, here's what he says in chapter 12. Let's get, get back to this. After the roll call of the faithful, all of these people who have gone before, here's the encouragement. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us. Caught you napping, didn't we? Yeah. That's all right. Let's start over. I want you to get a run and start at that. That's a really good one. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Nailed it. The pioneer and perfecter of faith. Who, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Get a grip on Jesus and don't let go. Run with perseverance the race marked out for you, he says. Jesus is the pioneer and perfecter of faith, he says. The pioneer and perfecter of faith. Jesus is the one who initially began to show us what it looks like to let God direct his life 100% of the time. Jesus was obedient to the Father even in going to the cross. He let God direct his life into something painful, excruciating, and obedience. Why? 
for the joy set before him. Jesus knew that glory was coming. Jesus knew new creation is coming. Jesus knew this right here, what we're experiencing now, was down the road. And it was for this that he was obedient and faithful and gave his life and let God direct his life. And the Hebrews writer is saying, just follow Jesus. Just follow that example and trust God that even when it's painful, even when it hurts, there's something good ahead. There's this connection between faith and reward. And it's this, these actions of faith that lead to the reward. Uh, what we're not saying, and, and hopefully uh, you, you catch this and, and, and maybe go back and listen to last week's message, is we're not saying that our acts of faith earn our salvation. Okay, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that, that our salvation produces a life of faith that allows God to direct our lives. And that the ultimate reward, this eternal kind of life that we are tasting some now is, is going to be daily life someday. And that's what we're looking forward to. And that's why we continue to take steps of faith. I, I want to give you a clearer picture, a, a really relatable picture of what it looks like to take a step of faith. And so we're going to have uh, one of our church members, Elizabeth Stump, share her journey with you. Um, my name's Elizabeth Stump, and we've been here about three and a half, three, three and a half years. I'm a skilled sewer in a factory, and um, it was getting really, really hard on me. I was, I was miserable, and um, so um, I began to just pray, and I asked the Lord to uh, please put me, I wanted to serve. And so every morning on the way to my job, I mean, I was thankful for my job that um, I wanted to serve. So I began, I mean, I would I would just cry. And I'd say, Lord, please put me somewhere where I can serve. So, um, because it was really getting hard on me. I was tired all the time. And um, so um, I talked to Clinton and told him what, what I wanted. I wanted to serve. And so he began to pray with me. So um, I didn't know where he wanted me. But I knew he wanted me to serve somewhere. My last week of work, I came to church that Sunday and I was uh, volunteering in the cafe. And um, I happened to see Jason, which you had announced that he was director over that. Or, and so I just thought, well, I wonder if they ever need help. So I went and asked him. And he was like, yes, we need help. So. I asked him the requirements and he told me, you know, serving hard. And I'm like, that's what I've been praying for. So that, yes. I'm, so I was excited. So I went back into the cafe and told Clinton and he goes, yeah, he goes, you, you have to do it. So I did. And I, I don't regret it. So I have, I have a piece like I haven't had for a long time. Well, I work in the residential area. Um, in one of the houses um, for Mephibosheth. I took a pay cut and um, all my benefits, um, I had good benefits. So um, I did give that up and lots of vacation time, but um, it, it, it didn't matter. I, I don't know how, I just said, I'm gonna get a reward better than this. I love it. Um, I take care of two individuals. It really touched my heart. And I just love him. <laughs> I'd begin to pray. That's what I'd done. And um, I'd have others pray with me. You know, get like my husband, I asked him to pray. And my group, I had them praying for me. Um, my Bible study here. Um, yeah, I had all them praying with me because um, I was just miserable. And I knew God wanted me somewhere, but I didn't know where to go. So I had I, I had people praying for me. I'd pray for myself and um, he'll put you where you are. And don't be afraid because if, if it's his will, he'll take care of you. So that's what I, I just had to do it. I knew that's what he wanted me to do.
This is a simple story of someone who recognized a desire in her heart to serve. Where do you think that came from? God, God put that in her heart as a result of her time in the word and time in prayer and listening to the Holy Spirit. And God put this desire in her heart that led her to quit a job or take a pay cut, lose her benefits and experience peace. Is that how most of us think about if we lost our job and had to take a pay cut and lost all our benefits that we would have peace? No, that's not how we think of that. But this is what it looks like to take a step of faith, to let God direct our lives into something uncomfortable and costly and find peace on the other side of that. And so I just wanna challenge you, what does that step of faith look like for you? What would it look like for you? Maybe you've been standing ankle deep on the shore and just enjoying how easy and comfortable that is. And maybe God is calling you to step out deeper, to get to a place where if, if Jesus isn't real and not holding on to you, you're gonna be in trouble because that's where the good stuff is. That's, that's where the peace that passes understanding comes from. That's where the joy that wakes us up every morning with confidence in God, that's where that comes from. And this is what points us to new creation and reminds us, hey, there's, there's something so much better at the end of this. I just wanna invite you to pray about maybe what your step of faith is, what, what's in front of you. We're, we're not, uh, it's not the same for everybody. We're not saying everyone should quit their job and go work for Mephibosheth, although Jason would love that. It would be great. Um, what we are saying is that, that God, if, if you spend some time in, in scripture and in prayer, God, God will put desires on your heart. You listen to the Holy Spirit and he, he has something that he'll put on your heart, a gift that he's given you, a passion that will invite you deeper. What is that? What, what, what is it that he's calling you into? What, what, what is the, the thing that will stretch you and grow you? What is the thing that will disrupt your comfort so that you can experience more of Jesus? I just want to invite you to pray about that with me. Would you stand? We're going to close with this. I'm just going to pray this uh, really dangerous prayer together. I mean, I wouldn't recommend praying it if you don't mean it because God might answer it and then you're in trouble. <laughs> We're going to ask God, what, what step of faith do you want me to take next? What step of faith do you want me to take next? Again, be careful because if he answers that and it's something that, you feel really uncomfortable or even scared about, then now that you know, you're responsible. <laughs> and you gotta do something. And man, that's really, that's really where the, the salt and light of the kingdom shows up is when followers of Jesus and when whole churches are allowing God to direct our lives through faith and the world goes, what are you people doing? The world looks at Elizabeth Stump and says, what are you doing? This is foolish to, to take a pay cut and give up your benefits to work for a, a residential care facility. What are you doing? And she's going, I'm, I'm walking by faith. And I'm, I'm going to bed at, at peace every night. And I'm waking up with joy every morning. That's what I'm doing. Why don't, why don't you join me? I want to join her. I want, I want to be like Elizabeth. And all the other people I know that have taken these kind of steps of faith. So I just want to invite you to pray this with me and, and let's go before God and just see, see what he does. Father, thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus to carry our sins to the cross, to pay the penalty there, to set us free from sin and death and invite us into your kingdom. God, it's just an incredible gift that you've been given, that we've been given from you. And we're grateful. And we know that you have saved us for a reason. You have redeemed us for a purpose. So I pray, God, what, what is my next step of faith? What is the next step I can take that allows you to direct my life? Would you show me what that is? And give me the courage, the confidence in you to step forward. And Father, I'm, I trust that when I do that, there will be peace and joy on the other side. So just show me, convict me in my heart, speak to me through your spirit and do the same for my brothers and sisters in this room today. And as we respond in faith, God, would you use us to be a light to our communities, to the people in our neighborhoods, 
the people in our families, the people in our workplaces, people in our schools, so that they will see Jesus for who he truly is. And more people will be a part of your family. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Go and be salt and light in a world that desperately needs Christ.